Hello, Wonder Rossi here, standing at the side of Interstate 80. That's right, you can get on this highway on the East Coast back in New Jersey and drive all the way to California on the West Coast mm, in something like two or three days, depending on how fast you drive. But how did people get across the country before the interstate was built? I mean, I-80 wasn't finished until 1956, I think. So how did people cross the country before that? Well, just like the pioneers, you could walk across the entire country, or you could get on a steamship and sail down the East Coast all the way to Panama, then cross the jungle, get on another boat, and go up the West Coast to San Francisco. But neither one of those ways was very fast. And so in the 1860s, the United States government decided to build a transcontinental railroad that would cut the journey down from something like six months to six days. The Transcontinental Railroad was a monumental feat of engineering, and there's all kinds of documentaries you can watch out there about it. In fact, I made a video about it myself when I went to visit the Golden Spike National Monument in Utah, which is the place where the railroad was finally completed. And it's just really interesting to learn all the details of how this thing was built. I mean, there was one team of guys laying tracks from the West Coast, and then there was another team of guys laying tracks from Omaha, Nebraska, and they were both going as fast as they could because they were getting paid by the mile by the federal government. And the guys coming out of Nebraska didn't really have it that hard. I mean, it was mostly just flat plains. But the guys coming out of California had a problem. I mean, they had barely gotten out of San Francisco, or I guess technically Oakland, when they basically hit a wall. The Sierra Nevada Mountains. These mountains rise up to 14,000 feet on the border of what's today California and Nevada. And to get from east to west, or vice versa, well, you had to get over them one way or another, and the railroad was no different. To me, the most interesting part of the whole transcontinental railroad was how they figured out a way to get over the Sierra Nevada mountains. And believe it or not, even today in 2022, you can go for a hike right through the very heart of the site where they blasted through these mountains. That's right, the original historic railroad tunnels that were blasted through the solid granite of the Sierra Nevadas are still here, but uh, they're long abandoned. Uh, the railroad stopped using these tracks back in 1993, uh, and they rerouted the railroad a little bit farther to the south. But look, now you can basically just walk through these railroad tunnels, which were blasted by hand by guys in the 1860s. Okay, I've had people telling me I should make a video in these tunnels for a long time, but for some reason, I don't know, it didn't seem that interesting to me. I know, I don't know what I was thinking, because uh, I did some research for this video, and it's super interesting. Okay, before we go in these tunnels, uh, where it's really dark, and it's really cold, and it's really muddy, uh, here's a little bit of background. Okay, we're talking about the 1860s. They didn't have modern technology. They didn't have jackhammers. They didn't even have dynamite. They just had hand tools, basically. Like, I was reading about it, and the workers who dug these tunnels, or blasted these tunnels, or... <laughs> <laughs> carved these tunnels. I mean, it was intense. They basically had a hand drill. It's like a long metal drill that one guy would like turn while two other guys whacked at the end of it with a sledgehammer. <laughs> and then they would, I guess the, the idea was to drill like an 18 inch deep hole and then they would stuff it with black gunpowder and then like get out of the way and blow it up and well, that would clear maybe a couple feet if you were lucky. I mean, from what I read, they they only they only made like a foot of progress every day. And that was working around the clock. This was slow going, I mean. Trying to go through solid granite with hand tools. Is it any surprise? And they actually had to blast 15 of these tunnels. That's right, they had to do this 15 times. This one that I'm standing in front of here is, I guess, kind of like the most famous of all the tunnels. It's right at Donner Summit, the very tippy top of Donner Pass, named after the Donner Party, 
okay, that group of pioneers that got stuck in the mountains and got snowed in for the whole winter and had to resort to cannibalism to survive. Well, I made a whole series of videos about them too, and that's a whole nother story. But this tunnel behind me here is uh, tunnel number six. Because remember, they did 15 tunnels. Well, I guess this was the longest tunnel. It was like 1,689 feet long, blasted by hand. Remember, there's guys with a drill and hammer. It's just, can you imagine how hard that would be? So they had one team coming from this side, and they had another team coming from the other side. But their surveying was so spot on that when they finally did meet in the middle, they were only two inches off. That's pretty impressive when you consider they were using hand drills. I mean, look at look how rough hewn this tunnel is. And that was all done by hand. Like I said, they didn't even have dynamite. I don't think dynamite had been invented yet. They had nitroglycerin, which was extremely volatile. And I guess some nitroglycerin was shipped to San Francisco and ended up blowing up at the Wells Fargo depot there. And well, unfortunately, a bunch of people were killed and it took out a whole city block. So. Uh, California wouldn't allow any more nitroglycerin to be imported. So I think they finally did figure out a way to manufacture nitroglycerin on site up here. I'm not sure how they did that, but even that though, it's like super dangerous. But somehow they managed to do it. They blasted all the way through the summit here. And like I said, I think there was a total of 15 tunnels. So <laughs> they did it 14 more times. And yeah, a lot of people did die in the construction of this. And I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, you know, they didn't keep such accurate safety records back then. There was no such thing as OSHA. So we don't know exactly how many people died doing this, but it was probably at least a couple thousand. Because it took something like three years to blast all these tunnels and get the railroad through the Sierras. I think they started in uh, 1865 and it took all the way to 1868. And then they finally got to the railroad to Reno later that year. But I just think it's absolutely wild that you can walk through something this historical with no fence or no historical markers or anything. You know, like I would expect it to be fenced off or at least have like a historical plaque at the entrance, but there's, there's nothing here. They, when they rerouted the railroad in 1993, they just abandoned these tunnels that were blasted by hand. I mean, what an insult to the memories of the people who did the work and especially the people who died doing it. Okay, I'm gonna walk all the way through this tunnel, tunnel number six, so I better get suited up. It's real chilly in here, and it's also real dark. I mean, you can see the other end of it, so it's not like you're just going into the void, but it's still pretty spooky. And to me, the spookiest part of all is like the feeling of the ghosts of all these railroad workers who spent hours of their lives in this tunnel. Man, it is really cold in here. And I'm shooting this video on October 10th. So can you imagine how much colder it would have been in the middle of winter? Because these guys worked around the clock, six days a week, all year long. They didn't take the winters off. No, they had to, <laughs> they had to build snow tunnels to get from their barracks, like their camp where they lived, to where they were working because there was so much snow up here. It's, I mean, Donner Summit, hello, the Donner Party. It snows a lot up here. Whew, daylight, <laughs> finally. Anyway, you can see here, uh, as soon as we leave one tunnel, well, we're coming up on another one, and then there's another one beyond it. In fact, if you do this hike, I think you can go a total of like a five mile loop. Like you can walk through several of these tunnels and I'm gonna walk through a few of them because there's something very interesting that I wanna share with you. But first let's stop here because there's an amazing overview. You can see exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about having to cross the Sierras. I mean, I think that over there is Donner Lake. That's the site of the infamous Donner tragedy. Seriously, I'm pretty sure that's where their cabins were and where there's a state park today and you can go in and it's a really cool museum. And the whole reason the Donner party got stuck there is they were trying to cross the Sierras here, which is, I guess, the most gradual pass. And you can see off in the distance there, that's Interstate 80. It goes right next to Donner Lake. And it's interesting how many people cross I-80 every day 
going right past Donner Lake and they don't know anything about the history of the Donner Party or what happened there or anything about the history of what happened over here. I mean, this area is just chock full of fascinating, weird history. And it's absolutely gorgeous. But I wouldn't have wanted to have to dig a railroad tunnel <laughs> through it. Okay, we're coming up on another tunnel, and this looks like a pretty long one. And I don't know, that first tunnel we went through, tunnel number six, is supposedly the most famous. I thought that was the summit tunnel, but it wasn't that long. You know, and in all the research I did, the summit tunnel was 1,689 feet long, and that was not 1,689 feet. Maybe this is the summit tunnel, because you can see how rough hewn, so to speak, this tunnel is too. I mean, this was clearly blasted by hand. That's why I say it's kind of weird and frustrating that there's no historical signage here. I mean, this should be like a friggin' national monument, you know? I wanna know, I want answers to my questions. You know, it'd be cool if there was like a, a trail map at the beginning of the trail that pointed out, you know, tunnel number six, the summit tunnel, whatever the longest one was. Gosh, look how beautiful this tunnel is. There's actually natural light in it, and it's not because we're getting towards the entrance. It's because there's these windows cut into the side. Look at that. It's almost like being in a cathedral. You know, the way this filtered light is coming in? It's really pretty. And I suppose even some of this graffiti is not that bad to look at. <laughs> And it just blows my mind that these tunnels were completely abandoned. You know, like I was saying, when they rerouted this railroad in 1993, well, first of all, I don't know why they rerouted it. I think maybe the grade was a little bit too steep or something. They found a, a better pass. Which brings me to another point. It's actually amazing. The, the unsung heroes of all this are the surveyors. You know, the guys who laid the course in the first place. I mean, they had to figure out you know, with railroads, they can't go up a very steep grade or down a very steep grade. So he had to plot, or they had to plot, a, a, a way for a railroad to get up and over this 7,000 foot pass. We're at 7,000 feet here. Okay, finally, we got to the end. Wow, that was a really long tunnel. I don't know, oh, I wasn't wearing anything to track my distance, but God, that had to be at least a quarter mile. And if all of that was blasted by hand, imagine that. And of course, as soon as we come out of this tunnel, we come right up onto another one. But this is interesting because, well, you can kind of see over here on the side, or I don't know, maybe you can't see, but uh, you can see where the tunnel just goes right into the side of that granite mountain. Okay, well, I could keep on hiking through these tunnels all day and enjoy the sweet smell of dog piss and enjoy the beautiful half-witted scribblings of California's finest graffiti artists. But rather than do that, I'm going to hike back the way we came and show you something that I think is the most interesting of anything here. <laughs> Okay, this is part of what I find most interesting about these abandoned railroad tunnels. Okay, it's real hard to get a perspective on this because, well, <laughs> I'm standing on the side of a cliff and there's a pretty sheer drop off below me. But essentially what it is, is a giant retaining wall. And on Google Maps, it's called the China Wall. You know, kind of like the Great Wall of China because it was hand built by Chinese railroad workers. And what's amazing about it is, every one of these rocks was just placed there by hand without any kind of mortar or cement or anything to glue them together. They were just, just gravity and physics holding it up all the way up to the top of the railroad grade. Now I don't care who you are, Mason or not a Mason, that's impressive, and it's just one of the many impressive things about the Chinese men who 
built this friggin' railroad. Most people know that the Chinese immigrants were a huge part of building the railroad. And I learned that uh, in school too, growing up, but I didn't realize how big a part of building the railroad they were. You know, talking about blasting all those tunnels through the mountains here, that was 90% Chinese guys, okay? I guess when they were building the railroad, they needed strong laborers to do the building. And back uh, on the uh, Nebraska side, well, they had plenty of, you know, Civil War veterans, Irishmen, all kinds of European immigrants, you know, big, strong men that were just happy to, you know, earn a good living wage building a railroad laying track. But over in California, well, it was a little bit harder for them to find laborers because, you know, they'd put ads in the paper saying, we need strong men to build this railroad, and they offered a decent wage. But remember, this was California in the 1860s, and by this time, silver had been discovered in Nevada too, so... Most of the men out here just wanted to go prospecting, you know, try to find gold or find silver and get rich that way. Nobody wanted to break their back slinging a sledgehammer and laying tracks all day. So they ended up hiring a bunch of Chinese immigrants. And I guess it was really controversial back then because, well, there was a little bit of nativism involved, a lot of Americans, which America was less than 100 years old, or the United States was less than 100 years old at that time, so... I don't know, I guess the people who had been there already, I yeah, didn't want to let anybody else in because it was getting too full or, you know, whatever. So there was some racist bias, but, uh, well, also to be fair, the Chinese were really hard workers. And of course, that's why the railroad bosses wanted to hire them. But it's also uh, what kind of antagonized the Irishmen and the other guys that were working on the railroad because when those guys would strike for better conditions, the Chinese would just come in and basically do the work that the Irish and the other guys wouldn't do. Although I should note, the Chinese did try to go on strike themselves once. And well, those railroad bosses back then were, they were tough hombres. And well, it didn't go so well for the Chinese strikers. Anyway, Chinese immigrants made up 90% of the railroad workers on the Central Pacific side. That's the side coming from California, 90%. And when they hired them at first, they were the, the bosses were skeptical, like, oh, well, they're not, you know, physically big like the Irish guys. But boy, those Chinese are hardworking dudes and they proved themselves in no time. And not only were they just exceptionally hardworking, um, they were also healthier in general, maybe because of their diets, which they tended to eat more dried vegetables and fish instead of, you know, beef and beans and the stuff the American railroad workers were eating. But also they didn't suffer as much from dysentery, which was a huge problem back then because People didn't really understand germs. I don't think germ theory was a thing yet. And they didn't understand proper sanitation. And so they'd bring out this big bucket of water for everybody to drink out of at noontime. And the Irish guys would be dipping ladlefuls out and guzzling it down without a thought to what kind of bacteria was in that water. But meanwhile, the Chinese guys boiled their water every morning because they drank tea. How about that? Because you have to boil the water to make tea. Well, it automatically sterilized all the water the Chinese guys were drinking. And so they didn't suffer as much from dysentery, which means fewer days missed because of sickness or death. You know what? I just saw some people hike down there. Let me see if I can hike down there and get a better view of this wall. Because I feel like you really can't get a sense of the scale of this thing if I'm standing right in front of it. Okay, here we go. This is a much better viewpoint. I mean, from here, you can really get a sense of the scale. How many rocks went into building this? Well, I'm calling it a retaining wall. I think there is some name for it in railroad speak. I'm not sure what that is, but look at that. Amazing. And all built by Chinese guys. I say guys, because I'm 99.99% .99 sure there was no Chinese women involved in the building of the railroad, but hey, correct me if I'm wrong. Anyway. It was really kind of sad the way the Chinese were treated. I mean, they were paid fairly. I think they got the same wages as the white workers. And, you know, they had their camps and they got Sundays off so they could hang out and gamble and smoke opium and, you know, do the things that they like to do in their downtime. But just the way they were treated by the country as a whole was pretty piss poor, frankly. I mean, you maybe have heard of something called the Chinese Exclusion Act. <laughs> Well, that was a bill they passed to severely restrict the number of Chinese immigrants they allowed into the United States every year. And matter of fact, the Chinese Exclusion Act, I don't think it was fully repealed until like the 1970s. I'm not kidding. I was trying to do some research into it. And well, it was really confusing, as is any legislation uh, <laughs> involving the United States government. But at least until the 1940s, they had these uh, immigration quotas on Chinese people. And 
Well, to be fair, it's probably because the Chinese guys were such better workers than the American guys, you know? The American guys wanted a chance to get some work, you know? Homer Simpson needs a job, too. But they did finally repeal the Chinese Exclusion Act, and nowadays... Well, nowadays, Chinese people are honored as model citizens. Huh, just kidding, we all know how that went during the pandemic. One of the facts I learned in my research that struck me as, like, the sorriest of all the facts was... In 1969, on the 100th anniversary of the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, they had this big ceremony in uh, Utah, Promontory, Utah, at the Golden Spike National Monument. They had all these dignitaries there. Hey, 100 years of the railroad! Woo! And so there were senators, and there were congressmen, and maybe the president was even there. But they didn't have one single representative for the Chinese community there. And I think that's really embarrassing and shameful. I guess they did have a speaker uh, that was supposed to talk on behalf of the Chinese community, a Chinese historian, but at the last minute they ran out of room, ran out of time, and well he got kicked off the bill. And I have heard that they made uh, room for John Wayne to say a few words at that ceremony, but I think that's apocryphal. I don't think, well that might not actually be true, so don't take my word for it, but well, gosh, it sure sounds like something they would have done back in 1969. But anyway, I just think it's really crummy that the workforce who basically single-handedly blasted these tunnels through these mountains didn't get any recognition whatsoever at the 100th anniversary celebration. And some might say that we're more than making up for that nowadays because well, a lot of people bend over backwards to give proper respect and credit to all these different ethnic minorities. And, well, I know it doesn't sit right with a lot of people, but when you keep uh, a story like this in mind, well, it kind of gives you a perspective on why these people are bending over backwards to give these uh, historic minorities their due. That was a pretty impressive feat. That was a pretty impressive feat. All of this is wildly impressive. And gosh, let's just give them a little credit. Anyway, this concludes my tour of the historic Donner Summit Railroad Tunnels and the Great Chinese Wall. Hopefully you found it as fascinating as I did. I mean, like I said at the beginning of this video, I had people telling me I should come check these tunnels out for a while. And I just thought, eh, tunnels, how exciting could that be? <sighs> how wrong I was. These tunnels are right off the highway, they're super easy to get to, and it's a really easy walk for just about anyone. I mean, it's totally flat the whole way. You can just walk as far as you want, you don't have to go through the whole thing but it's definitely worth at least taking a stop and taking a quick look at, because this is some fascinating history.